Go ahead. So now, Mert, good morning. Good morning, Jim. You met a lot of famous people in the past. You're one of the last living legends meeting Mr. Damon, Mr. Shingo, Mr. Ono. Can you share your experience with them? It's the, it's the little town that I have in life. It's amazing. Because I started off really as the dumbest kid in school. We used to have a spelling bee when I was in grammar school, and all the students would stand up around the room, and the teacher would, you know, read out a word, and you'd have to spell it. I was always the first one to sit down. I had a terrible memory. But it's amazing through life that I've been able to continually grow and to meet such amazing people. I mean, just think of the list of people that I've met throughout the world. I've met movie stars. I've met the you know, presidents. I've met the CEOs of maybe 50 different corporations. It's a magnet. And miraculously, as I've gone through life, I ended up going to Japan. I started a company called Productivity, and I wanted to find out who were the productivity growth leaders in the world, and I found that Japan was way ahead of everybody else, and so I had to go to Japan to find out what they were doing, and I did. And miraculously, when I get to Japan, I go to my first trip there, I go to a company called Nippon Denso. They're a top supplier to Toyota. And their plant manager was Mr. Ota. He was a real key person in, the, in the, the growth of Toyota. He was running the plant at the time. And he was teaching us what's called mixed modeling. This is a technique where Toyota is able to make different models on the same line, where most manufacturers in the world were just making the same model, the same color, etc. And he was teaching this. And then my guide says, Norman, we have to leave now. We have to catch a plane to go to Tokyo. And I said, uh, no. And I said, uh, okay. And this must oh, said, no, you can't go. You don't understand mixed modeling. You, you can't go. Um, so we stayed. And after his lecture, he gave me a sheet of paper. And the sheet of paper said, the study of the Toyota production system from an engineering viewpoint to Gao Shingo. I had no idea what it was, but I had a phone number. So I went to Japan, I called the phone number. It was Japan Management Association. And they just published a new book. We call it the Green Book, the study of the Toyota production system from an engineering viewpoint. And I turned to my group. I had about 12 travelers. And I said, who wants the book? Only one other person, the president of a company called Omar. So the two of us bought the book. And we did the exact same thing together. We sat on a plane for the next 10 hours and read the book. I was so fascinated with it that I ordered 500 copies to sell to my newsletter subscribers. And Jack, who was the president of this company, or Omar, he also bought 500 copies to give a copy of the book to every manager and every engineer. And the funny thing about that company is they all were trained in value engineering, value analysis, a marvelous technique that we should all really learn how to use. They took that book. And one year later, they became the best just-in-time company in America. Well, I was so lucky at that moment. It was about six months later. I go back to Japan, and I'm staying at the new Otani Hotel. And at the hotel, two people are speaking, just by coincidence. One speaker was Shigeo Shingo, and the other speaker was Taichi Ono. Ono was the vice president in charge of production at Toyota, and Shingo was their top consultant. Toyota, oh, at least in the past, had very few consultants. It is funny because consultants, because Toyota is now using their own consultants to teach the rest of the world out there. But back then, Toyota didn't like too many things, but they had Shingo. Shingo was funny, as if he was a consultant to Toyota. He was brought in by Mr. Ono himself. I had the privilege of meeting Shingo, getting to know him, the first time I looked at him, and I said, Shingo, I'm Norman Bodek. He looked up, he was in the wheelchair, and then he looked down. Then all of a sudden, ah, Bodek, son. He correlated that I was buying thousands of books from him, <laughs> and that, you know, because he never saw me before. And then, of course, I looked at Shingo and said, I want to bring you to America. And Shingo said, how can I go to America? I'm, I'm in a wheelchair. 
And I said, you're going to get well and you're going to come to America. And I, he brought, I brought him over dozens of times in the next, next 10 years. And I also got to know him very well, that I became his publisher and I published all of his other books. I published maybe 12 single books up to this moment. And of course, I also met Ono and I became Ono's publisher. I, mean, I said to Ono once, this is really funny, a number of things. I said to Ono once, um, because every time I went to Japan thereafter, once he knew me, I was able to bring my study mission to Toyota, and Ono always allowed it to visit the plant. A couple of things I think that's funny. Um, I said to Ono, I'm writing about just in time. I'm learning it from you. What do you have written down at Toyota that I could use? And Ono said, Norman, we don't have anything written down at Toyota because we're always changing. It wasn't 100% truthful because a friend of mine, Mike Warren, found the 1972 Toyota manual, all written in 1972. And me with Ono, this was in the early 80s when I first met Ono. And, and so, and one day I say to Ono another thing, I said, Ono, um, what did you do to discover just in time? How did you discover it? And he laughed and he said, Norman, I read a book. And the book was called Stay the Mark Today and Tomorrow by Henry Ford, who published back 1926, 1927. So when I came back from Japan, I called my librarian and I said, um, can you get me a copy of that book? And they did, almost overnight. They gave me a copy of the book. I read it, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And I can understand from Ono how he gathered so many of his ideas in just in time. Because 90% of them are in, are in Henry Ford's book. And then I did something. It was published by Doubleday. I called Doubleday on the phone. I said, can I have the rights to reprint this book of 1926-1927? And Double said, sure. And I paid him a royalty. I probably didn't have to do that because probably the royalty rights were gone, but that's okay. I paid them. I reprinted the book and I sold 35,000 copies in the next two years. 35,000 copies at $30 each. That's a million dollars in business that Ono gave me and it didn't cost anything because I didn't have to edit anything. I just produced the book. Another time, I'm standing with Ono. And I say, Ono, you're always so kind to me. You let my groups visit your plant in Toyota. But I, I gotta be frank with you, Mr. Ono. I said, the plants we go to, they're always old. They're always, look, look at the plant, they're always old. And Ono said to me, and he said this to me so often. Every time I met Ono, he would say to me, Odex son, you don't understand just in time. And he would say, what the fact that he looks like has nothing to do with us producing the best possible cars in the best possible process. The way it looks doesn't mean anything. And what do we do today? This is really funny, because if you go out, we've learned these 33 tools. Oh no, it never had any 33 tools. But we now have 33 tools. One of the, the tools is, you know, visual factory. And so we're told, clean up the factory, make it look sparkling, make all these visual things um, so that it looks beautiful. And I go back to Ono. Ono didn't care about a beautiful factory. He wanted to make beautiful Ono. Another time I was staying with Ono, and, uh, and uh, Ono, um, Ono was standing out in front of a warehouse because when he left Toyota, he didn't move up the line. And the reason he didn't move up the line to become president of Toyota because Ono had a reputation of him being ruthless. He was ruthless, really ruthless. I'll try to explain what ruthless means and why it was so powerful being ruthless. But, but Ono stands out in front of the warehouse and he looks at the management of Toyota Ghost saying, he says, I want you to get rid of the warehouse. We don't have warehouses at Toyota. I want you to make this into a machine shop. And I want you to retrain all of the people in here to become mechanics. I'll give you one year to do it. And the owners walked away. And of course, the managers were just shaking. <laughs> How are they going to take this warehouse, train everybody to be a mechanic and do it for one year? And the, and the, 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 the secret, the, 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 the challenge here is, Ono never told them how. Never told people how to do it. All Ono did was ask for the impossible. 
He asked the impossible because he never knew what people could do unless, unless he asked them. He'd go over to a manager with 10 people and he'd say, you've got 10 people in your, in your area. I want you to do it with seven. I'll give you three months. And he walked away. Never told them how. And sure enough, in three months, he came back. And because he was so powerful, he, we talk about empowerment. But in most American companies, power only exists at the top. They don't know how to distribute it. Well, Ono took the power. He was the plant manager. But he also knew how to distribute that power throughout Toyota because of getting people to do the impossible. He demanded of them. What I found was so unusual with Toyota throughout the world is all of the managers that I met really understood what Just In Time was all about. They really knew it. And all these other companies, they, a friend of mine, Paul Akers, you should read Paul Akers' book called Two Second Lean. Really very, very good. And Paul told me this recently. Maybe 2% of American companies are practicing lean. Maybe only 2% really understand lean. Maybe that's a high number. I think that's true. Most Americans are out running after these tools instead of simply doing what Ono taught us. Just demand people to do it and then see if they can or not. If they can't do it, you know, then you, maybe you can help them. Secondly, I travel with Shingo. Shingo was an amazing man. Shingo was probably ruthless too, but in a softer way than Ono. Shingo would do it another way that would terrorize people. One day I'm with Shingo, bring him to a dresser industry in America. They were making gasoline pumps. And I took them here, there for one day to consult with them. And we go over to a machine center. And in this center, a man is standing in front of a punch press. And at the side of the press are sheets of metal on the floor. And they pick up the sheets of metal and they put it on the bed. And then he puts it into the punch press. Then puts his two hands on each button. I think this is amazing. We have the two buttons because we don't care. We don't want the person to lose their hands. I love this because we don't care if they lose their heads. That means we don't design work for the heads of human beings, but we're there to protect the hand. So he pushes the two buttons, and the press comes down, and it forms the metal. Then the press comes up, and then the porker reaches into the press and pulls out the sheet of metal and puts it over on the side, stacks it over here. And Shingo always had a stopwatch, always carried a stopwatch in his hand. And everybody saw him working with a consultant, you know, being a consultant in America. He turns to the engineers. We had about three or four engineers around us. And he said to them, this is the key. What did you do to improve the value adding ratio? He was always looking to add value. How do you improve the value adding ratio? He would say, no, first thing he said, what percentage of the time are they adding value? What percentage of the time are they not adding value? One engineer said 100%. He's working. Another one said, no, 70%. Another one said, 50%. And Shingo laughed and said, no, 17% is adding, adding value. You're only adding value when the, when the press forms the metal. Everything else is waste. It's needed waste. Some of the waste is needed. And then he said to the engineer, what could you do to improve the rate? That's a powerful moment because we don't do that. We don't really ask. He said, what can you do to improve? Within seconds, one engineer said, you know, we could put a level ear. You know, you go to a cafeteria and the, the dishes are always at the top. You have a spring on the bottom. So we can have that for the metal so it's always here to slide in quickly to the bed. Another engineer said, well, we can put a spring inside the press so when the press comes up, the metal will automatically spring forward. The worker would save a few seconds. Another engineer said, well, instead of him stacking it on the floor, we can put a table over here where he can stack the foam metal. Three ideas came up. And then Shingo did something wonderful, which is very rarely done. Shingo just looked at them and said, do it. Shingo always said, do it. Do it. And of course, people would do it. Shingo was an amazing consultant, as you know. One day, Ono goes over to Shingo and he started to get his ideas crystallized on what Just In Time was all about. 
he said to Shingo, we have a problem with Toyota. I have to get the inventory down. Inventory is disturbing me. And he says, I want you to take this press. It's taking four hours to make a changeover on this press. I want you to do it in two hours. And Ono walked away. Once again, Ono's asking for the impossible. I had no idea. He had a vision of what he wanted because he went to an American supermarket and he saw in the American supermarket, and Mrs. Housewife was shopping. When she went to a shelf, she took off items to the shelf, and the store immediately tried to get items back onto the shelf. So he tricked it into his head, why can't I do the same thing in manufacturing cars? And so a blockage, of course, was a change over time. Shingo, Shingo said, okay, that is a magic moment in the history of Lean. How many people in the world would have said, okay, Shingo was so open, he just said, okay, and he sat. And he sat and he just looked at the machine for days. How many of you would hire a consultant to just stand in front of a machine and look for that? We don't do that. We expect results immediately. Shingo sat and looked. And then the idea bulb went off in Shingo's head, and it occurred to him what he called inside exchange of guy and outside of exchange of guy. So how could we begin to do outside or when the machine is working what could we do to prepare this guy so the change over time is less and as he began to focus on that direction getting prepared the next thing occurred to him is what could we do what he called inside of change of die what are we doing when the die when the changeover stops what could we now do to speed up that process so as an example he noticed the dies were very large and when the, when the changeover was taking place, they had to unscrew maybe, maybe 50 of these bolts in order to move out the old guy to move the new guy. So Shingo said, turn to him, look at a tape recorder. Tape recorder today is you take a tape, right? You click off the other one, move it out. You take the new tape, you put it in, and you clamp it. And the tape plays. Why can't we do this with a guy? He had the brilliance to see this in miniaturization. How can we apply it to something so big? to get rid of all of those bolts. Another thing is if you're in the plastic industry, it might take a half an hour to an hour to heat up the dye. And so they can only do that once the machine stops. Shingo said, why can't we heat up the dye externally? So when the changeover is ready, it only takes a few seconds to take out the old dye and put the new one in because it's already hot. The only thing you really need is asbestos gloves and a crane. Shingo, came up with these ideas as he was thinking. Ono comes back a day later and he says, Shingo, two hours is no good. You've got to do it in less than 10 minutes. And Shingo said, okay. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Okay. Who in the world would said okay? And Shingo sat and sat and sat and brought it down in less than 10 minutes. And virtually every single changeover at Toyota is done in less than 10 minutes. I'll never forget, General Motors took 40 hours to make a changeover. The three step dies that they had to stamp out the hood of a car, those three die changes, they looked almost the size of a railroad car, took 40 hours to make a changeover. I saw it done at Toyota in seven minutes, 40 hours to seven minutes. It just shows you what, what people are capable of doing. Funny, another day with Ono, um, I'm walking through Toyota Go Say with a group, and I'm looking at an operation, and they were making 60 hoses. 60 hoses. And I go to Ono, and I say, Ono, you're making 60 hoses at the same time. You're teaching us one piece flow. I'm not seeing one hose being made, I'm looking at 60 being made. And Ono said again, because he always said it to me, Norman, you don't understand just in time. What we're doing is the best that we can do at this moment. We're in business to make money. I mean, we're in business to make money. This is the best way we can make money at this time, and we'll make an improvement to get there. Another thing I noticed about Ono is, um, is that, you know, the machines, as you know, they looked old. I mean, the, the machines themselves were single function. I take Shingo to a, another plant in America, and immediately the people took Shingo over to a, 
multi spin spinning machine, I don't know, spindle machine, and it maybe had 12, 12 drills on it. And they say, How can we do this change over quickly? And Shingo looked at it, and he didn't know because at Toyota, they never had that kind of machine. They would have machines dedicated to each job, and the changeovers, if necessary, were done very, very quickly. Um, I was so lucky to spend so much time with the, I'm probably one of the few people left alive, I'm 85, who had the privilege to spend so much time with both Ono and Shingo. I do have many stories. You might like to read my new book called The Miraculous Life and see some of the other miracles that I have. And, and uh, then? Yeah. Now, uh, Norman, you have the talent to find talent in others. So you found another genius well, yeah, in Japan. I'm, this is my talent. I've been in Japan now 90 times, believe it or not. I've published 100 Japanese books in English, 100 great masters, great masters in Japan, I find. And I can't read a word of Japanese. I can't speak Japanese. I was smart enough to marry Japanese. My wife is a Japanese doctor, and she was my first translator, and I eventually ended up marrying her. And one of my latest discoveries, the man called Takashi Parada. I was teaching students of mine. I was teaching at Portland State University. Four students said to me that they want to intern with me, and I didn't know what it means to be an intern, really. I'm trying to figure it out. So I call a friend of mine, Shigeharu Nakamura in Japan, one of my former authors, one of these hundred, to hundred books that I published in English. And I said to Mr. Nakamura, would you help me teach my students? And he gave me a wonderful map, the map produced at Japan Management Association. It's a great map. If you want it, I'm willing to send you all a copy of this map. Um, in fact, Jim, Jim, Jim has a copy. We'll, we'll get a copy of this map for you. And on the map, it breaks up the plant into 33 sections, you know, like quality, productivity, uh, training, supply chain, etc. You look at your, your, your facility and divide it up to significant parts. And then the map looks at what technique in the world is the best in this particular area. So quality, what's the best technique in the world in quality? It might be Six Sigma, might be total, total quality management. Uh, as the greatest technique. Then the next column says, what company is doing it the best in the world? And if you look at quality, you see Six Sigma, and then over at the company, you see General Electric or Motorola. They were the first two companies to really do Six Sigma correctly. If you go down the list, the seventh line, it's a standard work, standardized work. What does that mean, standard work? You know, how do we get people to do the work absolutely the best way every single time? If you look at the world's best te technique, it says day-to-day -day management by objective. Then you look at the next column, it says two things, which is really very funny. It says one, the old Canon production system, and the second thing it said, Takashi Harada. Now why I think that, excuse me, why I think that's really funny, <laughs> because back in the 1980s, I happened to publish a book called The, the Canon Production System. This is really funny. This was just at the beginning when I discovered Toyota. I also just found this book in Japan Management Association. And this is interesting that 30 years later, it's in this map in Japan. as still one of the key things to look at. And then it also mentions Takashi Harada. And I didn't know anything about Harada from all of my visits. I just didn't know. Uh, Jim, you're looking for a copy of the book right here? Yeah, yeah. We have a French version there. Here. This is the, so anyway, I looked, uh, the name is Takashi Harada, and Mr. Nakamura starts to explain to me um, what Takashi Harada is all about. And I was very lucky because three of the students could, could read Japanese, and my wife is Japanese. So after the conversation with, uh, with Mr. Nakamura, we were doing this over Skype, by the way, back then. Now I'm using Zoom, which I love very much. And so my wife got a hold of Amazon in Japan. We found out Harada wrote seven books. We ordered all seven books. And I gave it to all of the people that could read Japanese. And then the next week when we get together, we all discussed about Takashi Harada. And they got me very excited about this man. 
very excited about what he was doing. And so what I do is I go to Japan, I meet these people, and I publish their books in English. So I called him on the phone. He doesn't speak English, and I don't speak Japanese. But my wife translated for both of us on the phone. And I said to him, Mr. Harada, I want to translate your books into English. I want to come and meet you in Japan. When can I come? He gave me a date. It was a month later. It was November, about eight years ago. I got on a, on a plane business class, so it's expensive for me to go to Japan. I go to meet Harada in Tokyo, and I say, Mr. Harada, which one of your seven books should I put in English? He says to me, Norman, I don't want you to publish any of my seven books in English. Now, that's a shock. I mean, here I come from America on an airplane. It cost me $25,000 to come to Japan. The man says, I don't want you to take any of my old books. But then he said, I want to write a new one just for you. Then I said something I should have said 30 years ago. I said, Mr. Harada, I want to co-author the book. I want to take your method and Americanize it to the American audience. And he said, okay. And I did. He sent me about 110 pages. In English, of course, his assistant um, read English and spoke English. This is, this is in French. <laughs> the, the book is now in uh, eight different languages. It's in Dutch, it's in German, it's in Polish, it's in Italian, it's in Spanish, it's in Portuguese. And now one of my students is putting it into Russian. And so I was very fortunate by writing the book. I say I, I should have discovered this early because imagine if I told Ono and Shingo I wanted to be your co-author. I wouldn't have had to do anything the rest of my life. Just co-authoring their book, you know, writing their laurels. I mean, I made millions from them anyway, but I, something I didn't say earlier. Well, I wrote the book, and as I wrote it, I really learned it, what it was all about. Then I decided I'm going to practice what it teaches this Harada method. This Harada method makes champions. In fact, if you've been following baseball at all, there's a baseball player from Japan called Shohai Otani. Shohai Otani was a Harada method student in high school. When he was a sophomore, he was taught the Harada method, and he filled out a form, and Jim is going to show you this form. It's a it's what we call a 64 chart form. He filled it out, and on the form, he put down that he wanted to be, I mean, he wanted to be able to throw a baseball at 99 miles an hour. And he wanted to join the major leagues in, in Japan. That was his goal when he was a sophomore in high school. Three years later, he was the first person picked to join the major leagues in Japan. He threw the ball at 99 miles an hour. You see, the secret is he picked a goal. He knew what he wanted to do. That's very rare that we, should, that we ever pick a goal. I don't know about you, but going through the whole American uh, educational system from grammar school to college to graduate school, I was never asked to pick a goal in my life. I just did what I thought I had to do, but never, never picked a goal. Otani picked a goal. He attained the goal. He was the first one in to Japanese baseball. This is the chart. Jim will show you more copies about. This was made by Otani. I happened to get a copy of it and translate it into English. Harada gave this to me. And, and Otani filled this out. Well, after he joined the major leagues, three years later, he was the number one pitcher in Japan. Number one, best earned run average in Japan. And he was the number one batter. It hasn't happened in over 100 years. Babe Ruth was probably the best one in baseball. Just doesn't happen today. Nobody else do I know that pitches and hits at the same time. But Otani wanted to do this. This was his goal, and he built up his skills. If you look at the chart, you'll see that he knew what he had to do to build up his talent, and he worked on it every single day following the Harada method. This Harada method is amazing. It makes, it helps you bring out the best from you. That's it. What Harada did with this method, when it took him 20 years to put together the method. He wanted to make champions. He was teaching at a school in Osaka. It was the worst school out of 380 schools. Absolutely the worst school. But it didn't, it didn't phase him. He still wanted to reach these children. He wanted them to become champions. He wouldn't accept where they lived. He, he would go to their house in Japan 
normally the teacher goes to your house. In America, it's probably, I never saw a teacher in my house, never. First of all, I was the dumbest kid in school. They'd never come to me anyway, never saw a teacher. But Harada would go to their house and he would see the living conditions where these students live. It was pitiful. It would break his heart when he'd see what the students had to live with. But it didn't stop him. And he put together this method. The method started out with four steps. Number one, I'm going to focus on their mental ability. I'm going to get them to believe in themselves. But he got no winners. He then focused on skills. They were throwing the javelin. He would have them study great javelin throwers and learn how to throw the javelin. Still got no winners. Then he focused on health, diet, you know, exercise, sunshine, lots of water, etc. Still got no winners. Then it occurred to him, what's missing is life. He called it life or living, the missing element. When one young woman won the gold medal, she was interviewed by a newspaper and television. And they said to her, what did you do to win your gold medal? She said, I did only two things. One, I did the Harada method, number one. Number two, I washed dishes at home every single night. Washed dishes home every single night. What's that got to do with winning a gold medal washing dishes every night? But it's the key. As soon as Harada discovered that key, he got these winners. Because he found people work very hard when they focus on themselves. Yes, they'll work very hard to attain something when they have a really solid goal. But the missing element is if you have to serve others, not have to. If you know that others are depending upon you, you will come across with that extra effort to become a winner. That's what he discovered. And so when he got these students to focus on others, in fact, part of the, uh, Arata came up with these five basic documents which Jim will share with you. One document is called the Long-Term Goal Setting Form. And on that form, there's a box, a matrix, where you write at least 10 items of why this goal is good for you. What's your purpose in life? What's your values in life? And you make sure, you try to get 10 of them. We used to have five, now we're doing 10. What's good for you materially? Well, I want to make more money. I want a Jaguar. Whatever you think, you want a new house. Great, put it on the chart. Then immaterial. Well, I want to feel better. I want to be happier. Then the other side of the matrix, which is the living side, is you must serve others. How does what you do benefit your family, benefit your children, benefit your company? Benefit your community on a material side and an immaterial side. The Rada method is amazing. What is it? It's a document filled with ideas that Harada very cleverly copied from the world's best. He stole it. In fact, if you go to Germany, they give you an opportunity to go to, instead of going to school, high school, you can go to become an apprentice. You can go work for a master. When you join the master, the apprenticeship program, the master gives you a broom. Sweep the place. And then he says, you're here to work and you're here to learn. But you learn on your own. I'm not going to teach you anything. So the student very quickly knows he has to copy the master. He has to steal from the master in order for the student to become a master. That's the secret, is copying. In the ninth grade, Norman Bodick had a terrible memory. That's why I was the worst student. My memory was terrible. So I go home. I'm, I'm sitting there sad. Gary comes over to me and says, Norman, um, why do you look so bad? I said, Gary, because I go home. I do my homework. I take the test the next day, and I can't remember. He says, Norman, same problem with me. But what I did is I take a sheet of paper, and I, when I do my homework assignment, I write on it all of the key ideas, and I put it into my pocket. Then when I take the test, I look at the sheet of paper. That's a great idea, Gary. I go home and I write all the key ideas and I put it in my pocket and sure enough, I'm taking the test. I know that, but I can't remember. I look at the sheet of paper and then I look up and who's there? The teacher. She grabs the sheet of paper and she looks at me with scorn in her eyes and face and says, Norman, you are a cheater. You're a cheater. And she told all the students, she told all the teachers, Norman is a cheater and they hated and hated me the worst year of my life. And who was I cheating? What's the difference if it's in my memory or it's on a sheet of paper? 
as long as I can use it, as long as I can apply it, as long as I can improve my skills and capabilities. In fact, the only real crime is me graduating high school without a skill to make a living. You can go through 13 years of school in America and all you can do is work with McDonald's. That is a crime. The Harada method is, is wonderfully the way it's put together step by step to help you bring out the best of you, to help you focus on you being the best and serving the world, serving others at the same time. And I wish you all at Toyota a great visit with Jim. And thank you so much for listening to me. Take care. And God bless you all. Okay. Isn't that wonderful, Norman, that after meeting Ono and Chino, that we now give Toyota the opportunity to be the first big company to apply a rather... Oh, this is wonderful. I'm so thrilled. You see, Toyota has... Two pillars to your success. You're, you're all familiar with it. One pillar is just in time with Vidoka, and the other pillar is called just in respect for people. Yes, Toyota focuses on respect for people, but they never had the tool up to now to give people real respect. You put people on an assembly line, you give them a three-minute tack time, they do the same thing over and over and over and over and over again on every single car. How much real respect is that? You can redesign the work and bring out the best of these people. It's amazing what they're capable of doing, and you can do it at Toyota. You make the best cars possible. Yeah, I have a Lexus. I bought a Lexus in 1990, and I've always had a Lexus since 1990. I love a Lexus. Every couple of years, I buy a new one. It's, it's wonderful. Toyota is a great company, and it's given me so much. And I hope that this talk and with you working with Jim will give a lot back to you. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Norman. Thank you. Take care.